Today's guest just got back from the Dakota Bowl. He's leading an up-and-coming girls basketball team in the winter, and thankfully his phone finally stopped ringing to record this podcast. Joined by Bishop Ryan, Athletic Director Roger Coleman, head football coach, head girls basketball coach. He's from Vegas. I'm going to go on and on and on, but we'll cover all of that. First of all, tell us a little bit about how you landed at uh, Bishop Ryan. Well, a few years ago, um, my passion, everyone knows, is, is coaching, definitely. And I knew that they had a, a spot open for a fire teacher and a football coach and head football coach. So I applied and, you know, being a high school head coach has, you know, been one of my dreams for a long time. So it just worked out perfect. And, and then when I came in for the interview, they asked me, you know, Mr. Kramer was leaving. So how would, uh, how did I feel about doing the athletic director duties too? I said, well, I haven't ever done that, but. I'll give it a shot. So here I am three years later. It's been great. You've been, been hold, you've been holding it down pretty good, too, because I got here in 2015, the first couple of years when it came to Bishop Ryan football coaches. It was like that uh, professor position, Defense Against the Dark Arts and Harry Potter, where every time there was one guy there for a year and then he was done. But you're kind of building something here now, man. It's good. Um, what do you need to tackle like day to day in your role as uh, athletic director? You mean right now or in a regular? In the normal <laughs> world that we're not in, yeah. Okay, yeah, normal world's obviously a lot different than now. Um, really just getting schedules sorted out, travel is kind of the main thing. And then, you know, whenever sport, one sports season's about to end, you're, you're gearing up for the, the next year with setting schedules with other schools. And, and then during the season, just checking on officials, checking that coaches have everything, kids are eligible, um, any communication that you need with – with the school administration or, you know, even your coaches and just, you know, every day is kind of a changing thing and you're just kind of waiting to see, you know, what you have to adjust to. Obviously, I'm going to try to get you in trouble here. What's the good and bad things about being an AD at a Class B school that has such a following that Bishop Ryan does? Well, the good things are just our tradition. I mean, I think all of our sports seem to be really competitive. So, I mean, that just makes it a fun atmosphere and and I think, I guess, I would say a negative. It's not really a negative per se, but it'd be, it would be really nice to have just a higher enrollment and more kids. I mean, a lot of our, our teams, there's times where we might have to cut a game or, or so because we only have, you know, eight players at a certain level and, and things like that. But, but, you know, I wouldn't really say that's a negative because the, the kids and families that we do have are, are top notch in my opinion. Yeah, that's a, that's a safe bet here for the enrollment count and all that good stuff. Now, talk about this year's Lions football team. How were you guys able to advance to the Dakota Bowl compared to maybe some of the other years? Besides, obviously, not playing Beulah and their goofy offense every <laughs> single year. Uh, yeah, that was two in a row they got us with that stuff. But, you know, I just think the buy-in from the kids, it was our third year of all of us being together in the same system. And... You know, anytime you have kids buying in and then they have three years, it wasn't like we had to relearn anything. And then we had an awesome group of seniors and great leadership there. So, you know, it was just kind of the all the puzzle pieces fell together this year with, with great kids and a great coaching staff and, and buy-in buy -in from our athletes. Looking at your playoff run, you beat New Salem 34-12 in the first round, then go down and beat Bowman County 52-21 to in the quarterfinals. Now, the Bulldogs, they had a dual threat quarterback, Jake Svihovic, that I'll admit got a lot of love in the press that you hated to see <laughs> either from me or our friends down at Bismarck closer to the state line. So, obviously, you had a lot of bulletin board material when it comes to playing Bowman County in the playoffs. Uh, how did it feel to shut them down after that? Well, it felt great. And, you know, we, we definitely put it on the bulletin board. I mean, our, our kids buy into that stuff. I buy into it. You know, a lot of, I guess, pro athletes will say they turn the press off and all that. But, I mean, we try to use it to fuel us. So, it was great going down there to get a win. But I'll tell you what, I mean, that game was 14 nothing quick. We turned the ball over right after that. And it was like, oh, man, this this can't really be how it ends. And then, you know, our kids responded great. And, and then we, we ended up kind of blowing them out there at the end. Makes guys like me feel really good knowing that somebody's watching it and using it for something. So, yeah. I'll give you the floor right now. Do you want to give any other teams bullets and board material going into next season? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fine. Well, you had your chance. Uh, what changed between losing to Velva in the regular season, 32-24, to and then turn around, go to their place again, and beating them 32-20 to in the semifinals, getting you to the Dakota Bowl? Well, I think the main thing is there was just some some pretty bad coaching in that first game. And I told our kids, I mean, we 
we averaged almost six yards of carry in that game, and we threw the ball a lot more than we ran the ball in the first contest. Turned the ball over four times, didn't put Nick Sanders, our quarterback, in good position to win. And it was just – it was very bad play calling and coaching. And, you know, I was I was grateful they gave me a chance to kind of redeem myself and redeem ourselves. And, and then the second game, I mean, we just – pounded the rock at them and, and we're pretty physical and then the weather got kind of crazy and we built a lead to where you know we we still withstood their onslaught at the end there to try and even it up but um yeah I would say that was the biggest difference is really just our putting our kids in better positions to be successful you guys go to the Dakota Bowl and everybody was really psyched for that uh, unfortunately you fell to a really really good Langdon area and more Union team that in that game there was a matchup where both sides had a lot of talent that is going to be coming back next season so right now I know we're far out but I mean how likely does it feel that you could see those guys again in the playoffs or maybe just in Fargo yeah I mean obviously the goal is to get to Fargo and, and win it now we've been there and and that just you know fueled the fire if you will so I think the the odds of those matchups are happening are definitely definitely could happen I mean we lost a lot of big dudes up front so that's kind of where we have to really figure out who we're going to be. And most of our skill guys are back. And then, of course, they have those two round pro brothers that are that are phenomenal. So, um, And then, you know, Velvet didn't lose too many right down the street either. So it's going to be another competitive battle just to, you know, to, to get out of the region or win the region and, and see where you can go in the playoffs. What's got to be the game plan when you're going against guys like Simon at quarterback and then Grant Romfield at running back next year? Well, I think just maybe do a better job containing them. I mean, they really hurt us on quarterback runs, and I think his speed was something that maybe surprised us a little bit. He ran away from some of our kids. We didn't think that he could. And then uh, just, you know, they're looking back on it, and our our the running back screen that they had, that was the play that, that I was scared of the most, and we repped it and drilled it. And, and then we come to the game, and they go like four for four with huge plays on it. It was, you know, just a little lapse, and – and discipline and fundamentals of what we what we worked on but I mean they're they're just a great team so really containing those two and I mean they had athletes everywhere that Jackson Delvo I mean he busted a big big touchdown catch on us too um our corner kind of tripped itself on that one but you know it's just just the battle and the things that don't go your way and that's how it goes so when you look back at like the, cu- the couple times where things don't go your way on the football team is it kind of a blessing and a curse where you have a bunch of confidence in your guys, but like you said, you said in that game, they explored some matchups where we didn't think they were going to. Does that kind of happen sometimes? Yeah, I think definitely. I, I think probably the biggest growth that I've had really as a coach or play caller for sure was actually that Velva loss. If if we don't lose that Velva game, I really don't know if we make a run like we do just because that kind of changed the identity of, of what – kind of we, maybe I thought or we thought the team was going to be, and then it changed it to where we started going two backs and kind of pounding the ball. So I think, I mean, it's it's really bad to learn a lesson in the Dakota Bowl, but, um, you know, there's next year where we're, we got to correct those errors that led to that defeat. Because you don't know that you guys need to make that change if you win that game the way that you played. And then maybe... In the Velvet game. Yeah, and then maybe you don't lose or you don't win the semifinal. Right, absolutely. Yeah, it, I mean, it just, everything kind of steamrolled from there. Like when we played uh, DLB, we put in kind of, not a new offense, but new structure to the run game, and it was just, it was deadly in that game. And that was something we never would have done had we not went back and looked at that Velva game. So, I mean, I had a college coach who was a great coach, and he always said, you know, the guys who say they lose more from from losing our losers, but <laughs> I, I guess I don't, I don't agree with that. I, I think I learned more from losing, actually, than winning, but. All right, loser. <laughs> Sadly, it was <laughs> Where do uh, your skill position guys you brought up coming back? Quarterback Nick Sanders, he had some awesome weapons to use with uh, Jackson Feller running back. Uh, Logan Merck, kind of a gadget guy, running back wide receiver. A couple of dudes that look like McCaffrey out here at Bishop Ryan. Uh, where do they go from their 2019 performance into next year? You know, I think only four of those guys already with, you know, with the COVID shutdown. I mean, I've been getting a lot of texts and, and pictures, even news articles of, you know, they, they're kind of building their home gyms and and not supposed to be getting together. And I don't control that. I tell them to stay away from each other, but getting in some workouts and and bettering themselves already. So I think just the not only the, the physicalness and their skills that they have, but I think all those guys have the, the mental toughness and the mental edge and the preparation to even excel farther than they did you know, this year, but 
it's won and lost up front. You know, we gotta we gotta build these young guys that are gonna step into the lineman role for us. The only Merck gym that I've been to or any gym at all has been their Taekwondo place. So, I mean, I don't know where you're getting any other home gym stories from other news outlets <laughs> because that doesn't usually happen. But um, yeah, you kind of touched on it a few times. Uh, replacing guys like Keegan Hengen, Noah Swigarden, Corbin Okasin. Boy, that's three dudes right there. I mean, who's in line right now? Yeah, I mean, we have – if you look, losing those guys is, is going to be rough for sure. But next year, if you kind of look at a projected lineup, we'll probably be all juniors and seniors across the board, which is which is great. But the – I guess the experience there um, isn't as much. But, I mean, we got guys like Stephen Fred. Bram Johansson's willing to step up and, and jump on the line. Um, Jacob Fricky. So we have some guys, and then we probably have one where, one position where it's going to be like, all right, you know, you might think you're better at this position, but we need alignment, so we're going to plug you in. And and we've had good luck having kids buy in. We had Casey Larson, who was a captain for us this year, two years ago, or my first year I took over, he was 156 pounds, and we need a guard. I'm like, uh, you got to play guard. He's like, well, I'm like the third fastest kid on the team. I'm like, well, you're playing guard. You're going to be a fast guard, <laughs> buddy. <laughs> I mean, he bought into it, and he was a great leader for us and played played guard for us for three years and unfortunately had some injuries last year and didn't didn't get on the field as much as he wanted to. But So one of the narratives that we always like to drive at around here is uh, – Something that you football guys didn't really help out with uh, in last season was joining the co-op of uh, Bishop Ryan and Al Redeemers. I just did this big story about Brody Bosch going to Al Redeemers, or from Al Redeemers to Bishop Ryan, and that happens, and we can drum it all up. It's got a lot of play, but these Crosstown rivals, now they're working together on the football team uh, with that in mind, thanks a lot. Who made the biggest impact from the new cast of players that you got from our Redeemers in the first season of the new co-op? Well, two kids. Uh, and it was like we talked about Casey Larson as the captain. Um, hurt his ankle, then he ended up blowing his knee out. So he was completely shelved. And, and Cutter Kent stepped in at guard. And, you know, we got him. He was extremely raw right away. The first few practices, I know he was struggling. And he won our Most Improved Player Award. Just a just a grinder, physical kid, battled every day. Um, so he was huge to replace that uh, on offense. Without him, we're not going to the Dakota Bowl. And then defensively, same position, linebacker, but it was Ryland Bibeto who came in at linebacker, another tough kid, battles, hardworking. And without either of those two replacing those roles, I don't think we can make that run at the Dakota Bowl. Is Ryland the kind of guy where he plays a game against somebody and then in the aftermath they're going to be going to his family for teeth work or what? <laughs> I don't know about that, but, uh, I mean, he's going, to be a, he's going to be a tough kid. He's, he's only going to be a junior this coming year, so I'm excited to see his ceiling. Talked about, like, the all-encompassing strengths and weaknesses of the team that's coming back, but... What also comes back, obviously, a long time in this region is you guys and Valva have been at the top for years now, and obviously that's what we're kind of like. All roads lead to this game every regular season, whether it's at the beginning or at the start of, or at the end of it. But do you have to be worried about anyone else right now? And don't give me the, we always have to be worried every week, because you're going to give me that for the news. But... <laughs> And no, when I you think, look around the region, yeah. what else do you need to be concerned about? Well, I think DLB, I mean, that's a school. I was I coached there, and they got a ton of kids and a ton of athletes and a good coaching staff there. So I think they're always they're always kind of right there. And, and Ned Rose, you know, is always an up-and-coming school. I thought last year maybe they they thought their ceiling was a little bit higher, so I'm sure they're going to be hungry to go out again this next year. They might miss then, that Egan kid. He's a monster, Well, yeah, he, is, yeah. he was a beast. Yeah. So I think, I mean, I think it's kind of been a three-horse race. And, and to be, you know, honest with you, like you said, if we're being honest, I don't know if that's going to change too much going into this year. For sure. Year. So I was just, I was talking with Ben Magnuson a little bit about, you know, Kersey and Calvin signings. And it's always happening at Bishop Ryan. I'm always coming to a signing day with, you know, your sweet little backdrop that you have put up in the library. So when you look at the football team, you had a couple guys – sign um this season tell tell me a little bit about how they were able to get to college level which guys i mean we got a lot you mean our football oh guys? okay yeah, hey. yeah yeah football guys <laughs> only well i mean keegan keegan's going across the street to minot state and i mean that he's just a great kid and a great leader and like we 
had an award this year that we've never had. It's just our line award, which he basically represents everything our school should be and every so student So it's the Keegan Hendrum Award already now that he's gone. Well, hey, maybe. But yeah. I don't know the next time I told the kids, I said, you know, this, this award's going out. you got to earn it. It's just not going to be a one-year thing. So um, just a great guy. I mean, he led in fundraising. He led on the field. He was a captain. Never, you know, he, he was always like another coach on the field. And then with uh, – with Corbin going to St. Cloud wrestling, I mean, that's that's big time. Like, they're a national contender every year. And that kid, I mean, right after football got done, he's he's in the mornings wrestling, practicing in the morning with his brothers rolling around. Then he's got it after. And, I mean, the the sky's the limit for him, too. I would, I would love to see him still play football again at the next level, too. But, I mean, wrestling's his passion. So, him going to St. Cloud's awesome. And then, like you said, the... The two baseball guys, best friends, going to play at, at Mayville together. Like, that's just an awesome story. You don't want to get a call from the Lundines, though, even though he's going to Mary, right? Yeah. Well, he's going to Mary. You know, I got to represent the Beavers a little bit. So, uh, But, no, I, that coaching staff is awesome. They came in. I talked to Coach Bagwell multiple times, and, you know, they got a lot of young dudes. He just signed the new coach from Carroll. So, I think, I mean, Jagger going there to play safety, I think that's an awesome fit. And I'm – I'm excited to see, I guess, him, Keegan, play against each other, and then if Jagger gets a chance to play against his brother, too. They got to so send him on like a safety house. blitz right into Keegan's yeah. gap a couple years yeah. down the road or something. But, hey, for right now, we're still saying Beavers all the way. Who are the next guys that you still have planned for you in high school that you could see making a sign-in day? Well, I think, I think Jackson, Logan, Bryson – I mean, really, all those guys. I think Nick can play at the next level. I think Cutter can play at the next level. Um, just about our whole senior class that's coming back. I think all those guys can if they want to. And I know, you know, a few of them are extremely interested in it. And then um, there's a couple I'm not too sure about. But I think I think for sure. I know Jackson 100% wants to. And I think he can play uh, at, at a couple levels around here for sure. Yeah, I was going to say, are they all thinking around North Dakota right now? Are they thinking? D2 levels or even branching out a little bit? You know, I think right now, like, you know, everyone sets their sights high, which is perfect and awesome. But then once those schools start calling them and seeing, you know, what's a better fit, then you got to figure out, you know, what, what town you like the best, what school, what coaching staff. So, I mean, I, I think any of those guys can play at the D2 level um, for sure, the NAIA. So I think. I think there's going to be multiple signings again next year for you. Another hat that you luckily enough wear due to your haircut here at Bishop Ryan is uh, girls basketball coach. Yeah. Something else once football is all wrapped up and you're done going to the Dakota Bowl. Um, how different is it, man, going from coaching football dudes to the girls basketball team? Yeah, that's probably the question I get the most. I think, and I mean, it's a little bit different. I don't, I don't coach the same way, but at the same time, I'm still the same person. I'm going to be. Um, so you got to adjust some things and figure out personalities like you like you do with the guys. But um, there's a little bit of adjustments, but I'm always going to be who I'm going to be, and I'm going to coach that way, I guess, regardless of who I'm coaching. I've coached my daughter since she was a kindergartner. And I was maybe a little more tame back then. But coaching them hard? <laughs> but, you know, you know, now she's a sixth grader, so if I'm coaching her, I'm coaching her hard. Yeah, because, I mean, how receptive do you believe the football players are going to be to uh, all your jokes about memes that you think land really well with the girls' basketball team? I'm thinking about, like, the scrunchy face meme on Facebook. See you next year on December thirty hey, first. The girls love that. They we, they had to win just for me to do that. <laughs> oh really? Which game was that? <laughs> oh, the last one. Or... The last one. Yeah, the yeah. last one before the break. So I told them. I said, "Well, we we got to win." And then and then I got to do the have, little see you next year meme. Have you ever taken a photo of yourself and you could just hear more than that one just by looking at it, like some kind of <laughs> kind of thing or what? I don't know. I hope not. <laughs> You're ready for the next question. I can already, already yeah. tell. Uh, what clicked for the girls during the postseason? I know it's a cliche that we want to see it at that moment, but it looked like you guys were playing your best down the stretch there. Yeah, it's been that way for the last two years, and I just think it's something that, you know, we just get going. We start building confidence, and and I, I guess I don't really know what it is, but I do, I do preach to them. Like, the regular season, especially here – literally means nothing everybody makes a district tournament you could be an eight seed and win a state tournament I mean that's obviously really tough to happen but probably never happened but you can like everybody makes a district tournament all you got to do is be one of the four of the eight there and then you got to win the region tournament obviously to go to state so I just think you know we are treating almost every game more or less like practice and and building from there and we we had some duds certainly in the middle and then uh oh you did really you know built it up in the end so I think that's just a philosophy, and we just buy into that because it's, it's true. We all make playoffs. 
What are you liking about the team coming back this winter? Basketball, I think, you know, everything. We lost some some key seniors, but we also, you know, Maya and, and Grace Lee, we lost two starters, but I think some of our younger girls are ready to step in and fill that role. And we had, you know, we had a lot, have a lot of girls coming back and played a lot of minutes. And again, it's kind of going back to the football thing. Like, this is our third year. They're all kind of bought in. We don't have to learn, you know, how we react to each other and a bunch of new stuff. We're just building on what we already know and trying to get better at that and adjust a few things. You said younger girls had to step up, but another player that was a younger player last year was uh, Sydney Upton, and you put a lot of responsibility on her, it seems, from start to finish of the season. Uh, God only knows, and I know we're at a Catholic school, but God only knows like what her potential can be as she continues on. Right now, where do you kind of rank her among maybe the better players in the district as she goes into her junior season? Oh, she's right up there in the region. I wouldn't just say district. I think she's one of the better players in the region. Does she start on rugby right now? Probably. She should. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Find a place, position with basketball. Find a place. So, no, I, and I've told her, you know, we've had talks about, you know, how high I think her ceiling is and that I, I'm going to coach her hard. Like, she just has to get used to it because her potential is up there. And, and so, yeah, we, we relied a lot on her. And usually when we needed a bucket, she, she went and got one. She had two buzzer beaters this year. So, that's, that's pretty dang good. You guys have uh... – UADs, especially at Bishop Ryan, have uh, big decisions to make, it seems, every single day. But already kind of touched on one of them was finding the new head boys basketball coach, going from Jeremy Feller to uh, Brody Bosch. Um, when you learn the news from Jeremy, what's kind of the timeline between that day and then hooking up with Brody and getting him hired? Uh, it well, was Friday, and that was kind of the day school stopped, actually, when, when Coach Feller came in and, and resigned. So... Really, once, I guess, school got put on hold and there's bigger fish to fry or bigger problems. Really? A Friday fish fry joke, really? Well, hey. Yeah, yeah, okay, it works, go on. That's right, they're in Lynn. <laughs> so, um, yeah, well, it was probably a, another week where before we even started, hey, like, we got to get going on this and, and just figure it out. And, and so I'd say the timeline was probably about a week. And then Brody, I mean, he had a lot to think about. I mean, that's a big decision. And, and it was probably two or three weeks two weeks or so that he, he decided that he would take the job. And, you know, I'm thrilled. I thought he did a great job as an assistant here. I think he's going to do a great job as a head coach here. You know, I think Bishop Ryan fans really like to see their teams win. And Jeremy Feller, you know, he went to state championship games as a local coach here before. Obviously he uh, did a lot of good things for you guys. How concerned were you with maybe filling the shoes with another coach that could get you guys to that level still? I wouldn't say that was a huge concern. I mean, and I, I think Brody can be that guy, and I think that we have the players and athletes here to do that. Um, and Jeremy did a fantastic job. He was great at our Redeemers. He was great when he was here. And so, you know, we're just – we're hoping Brody does the same thing. And he's he's been in two region championships his first two years as a head coach over at our Redeemers. So, you know, we want – we didn't, we didn't make it there this year, but I mean, we're always expecting to try to make a run at state. Like you said, Bishop Bryan fans, but it's not just the fans, it's the kids, the players, the families, the ADs, and the coaches. I mean, we all love winning. Mm -hmm. That's why we're doing it, right? Man? <laughs> yeah, I know. That's why we're all here. So uh, how soon after the coaching move had to happen where you were looking for the next guy, how soon was Brody on your radar? Was it almost immediately? I mean, how was he one of your, like, the top choice that you had? Yeah, he was, into it? I mean, I, I, I thought, you know, if, if, if he would be willing to come back, I think he would be a great fit just because like his, you know, everything that he's done here for as a career playing and then as an assistant, he coached under me, um, he's an assistant football coach under me too. So, I mean, obviously you see the guy here working with you, working with the kids and then goes as a head coach at RD has great success. And then, you know, you know, his background here. So I think it was, you know, it was, it was a no-brainer. He was, he was definitely towards the top of the list or at the top of the list. Yeah, I mean, how big of a draw? I mean, what does it feel like for a Bishop Ryan player to come back and be a coach? Why is it so important? Just, I just think the, the culture here and the, the tradition. I mean, we got banners for just about every sport on the wall. There's a lot of pride um, here being a Lion. So I just think, you know, like he said, when we talked on the phone, I think he said as a second grader, he started as like a water boy. So, I mean, it's. You know, to be able to come back and coach at his, his alma mater where he had such a great career, great times, I think it's I think it's awesome. You guys have been around him a lot when he was an assistant here. Uh, what kind of a coach are you getting from him? 
I think he's he's got extreme basketball knowledge. His basketball knowledge is is top notch, and and he assisted under what I feel is one of the better coaches in the region too that we've seen, and that was Brock Teets, which obviously doesn't coach anymore. But I think just the pedigree of the guys that he's worked for, played for, played under, and worked for is just is great. And he has great relationships with the with the the kids. You know, when you did the interview, the last podcast or whatever, when we hired him, you just listened to Zach Henderson talk about what. Uh, what Coach Bosch like meant to him, and I think the, I want a guy exactly like Brody, please. Exactly. Yeah. So that I mean that relationship that he builds with the players, like you can't that comes second to nothing. So you know I think that was those are the main qualities there. Yeah, you bring up what he meant to our Redeemers, and obviously as they make their search, uh, they'll miss him for sure. And it kind of brings in like the other side of it. I mean, do you feel like? Um, do fans of other schools maybe get annoyed seeing all these Ryan guys come back or they just gel or I mean, what is there, is there any hate there or no? I don't know if they get annoyed or there's any hate. I mean, they got, I think a lot of them understand. I mean, you know, Brody's a Bishop Ryan line pretty much for life, whether you came back here or not. Doesn't have to be just about Brody. I'm not making it just about Brody, you know, but yeah. Well, who else? I didn't graduate from here. <laughs> yeah. I was a minor high guy, so. Okay, we'll file that under gel, I guess. I don't know. What I can be really jealous about is all the times you get to go back to Vegas. I've been there a few times already, but you're definitely back there more uh, being from there. Uh, have you planned your trip back there for the first Steelers-Raiders game yet? Because I know you're a big Steelers guy. Well, they're not playing there this year, so uh, you can look. Th you can look through like the division. I don't. Yeah, I don't like, know. Years how, down the road, I don't know though. how that matches up. Is it, is it on your right. radar or no? If I if I can get to the game, if I'm not coaching, I'm definitely going to the game. And I actually looked at getting Raiders season tickets, but I, I missed the window. I guess on that they never they took my hundred dollar deposit. But they never gave me up. They seem like a pretty competitive season division. ticket holder list. Kind of, you see the Golden Knights doing it, and yeah. the Green Bay Packers like to pretend that they're super popular. I guess so. Maybe the waiting list is just too tough on you. So you're at least trying to get Raiders season tickets. So how much? How close are they to your fandom of the Steelers if they're going to be in your town now? Uh, probably not very close. Depends. Depends if they start winning. If, if they keep well, I can't even say if they beat the Patriots because the Patriots. With Tom gone, they should probably be done now. But um, I get I mean, if I had to pick a second favorite team, they'd probably be a second favorite team. But there's a big difference from, you know, your first favorite team and your second. How do you land on Pittsburgh to begin with? My dad, he's from Pennsylvania. So he's he was born in Dubois or Penfield area. And then he was a, he was a military brat. And, uh, yeah, I was just born into it. Luckily. Unlike you Eagles fans. Yeah, as close as I ever get to the Pittsburgh area is Latrobe, the origination of uh, Rolling Rock beer for the boys' cabin trips. So, I mean, hey, it sounds like a good place to live, but I couldn't prove it to you. Uh, do you take the Penguins over the Golden Knights as well or no? Probably. I'm not a big hockey fan, though, to be honest with you. i got some buddies, and my dad's a big Penguins fan. So, like, if they're out, I'm cheering for them. I know they had their great run, but... I didn't want to jump in like a bandwagon fan. I just like giving you grief about the Flyers is all. Well. Yeah, I was going to say, we let Jake Stack talk about Duke instead of Ben Magnuson talking about Duke, and we can let him <laughs> talk about the Penguins instead of you talking yeah, about the perfect. Penguins. Because I'm just going to get all that out of my system on that episode anyway. So being from there, I'm wondering if you have any, like, a vacation game plan that is beyond being basic, because that's pretty much what I am when it comes to going to Vegas I'm on the Strip and Fremont Street the entire time. Uh, since you're from there, do you have any big uh, recommendations on where to go? I don't know. I guess I'm, the last time we went, we went last summer, and we found this nice all-you-can-eat sushi place. I've never done that before. Uh, Yumaya Sushi, if you want to. Next time you're there, you can look that up. It's a few miles off the Strip. But, I mean, that was one of the best experiences. And then my, my aunt, who I haven't seen for – probably haven't seen her for 17 years, she, she drove in from Pahrump and – just hung out and and that was that was good but you know been to lake me done some jet skiing and and boating but i don't know i guess i'm i'm pretty basic too we all are but it's just a great place to be yeah i saw uh Perump on an episode of bar rescue and i don't know if i'll be able to make the trip all the way out there for when i go there next because i'm definitely going there next but um, i love the piano bar at harris carnival court more than the carnival court itself Big piano bar guy. I mean, whenever I go to New Orleans, I'm going to like Pat O'Brien's, and like that's the place to yeah. be like for hours on end. And I was there for my buddy's 25th birthday, Eric. We did everything under the sun. Huge vacation planner. My 
family made fun of me for like the amount of time. But you only turned 25 once. And True. we were in the piano bar for his 25th birthday for a little while. And we have you done the zip line on Fremont Street? I have not done the zip line. I did do the rides. Well, not the new rides, but the old school rides up at the stratosphere. You have to, you have to, my buddy jumped off the stratosphere and my dad and I are, ex, are exactly the same. Uh, he hates high rides in general. I hate high and slow. So like when I did the zip line, I hated waiting in line for it up yep. top. But once the thing went, I was good to go and it was a fun time. You got to look up on my Facebook. He did a picture or a video of he buys me the stratosphere rides and I don't want to do it. And he just like puts me on there. <laughs> and like the spinning ride was good. Like it rotated until I could see like the golf course. I'm like, okay, that's a pretty sight. Oh, but then yeah. it spins around and I can see the building that I'm no longer on top of, mm-hmm. which is just brutal. And I shut my eyes the rest of the time. I'm, I'm going up and down the spire. And I had my eyes shut so much where, like, every time it goes up and down, it pauses a little bit. But at the very end, the girl had to come around and, like, unsnap me from the thing because I wasn't sure if the ride was over and I was just petrified. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't like the high and slow. I love roller coasters, love things like that. The but New I, York, New York one was awesome. That one I've been on a few times. That one's fun. Um, but back to Vegas, I guess, like you said, the other thing, like, I'm an eater. That's We go to eat. I play poker and I eat, really, when there I go, go. there usually. And the uh, the Bacchanal buffet. It's expensive. It's like sixty or seventy bucks in Caesars. Though. You've been there. I haven't been there yet, but it's, it sounds like it's it. worth yeah. it. It's worth it. The expensive steak places. I would recommend not doing those on the strip. I've done those a few times. Not worth it. Um, I think my dad and I blend in though well enough because one time we went to a breakfast buffet and I'm I'm fortunate enough he's like a seven stars member and he gets all these oh, Harris nice. he gets all these Harris benefits and so like we go through like this long line of like a hundred people yeah. to like the the our post and there's like four people and this guy is probably waiting for an hour and he's like oh this is the line for us seven stars here if you're not a member you have to be in this line and we are we look. Dumb act and trying to like. That's pretty good. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. I, I go. With well, the, we are. So I go with the buddy who gets yeah the comp rooms, no paint resort fees, but he's only a, he's only a diamond. But so I piggyback off of him to cut the taxis and cut the lines. But you know I'm just a measly old platinum or whatever I am. So, I don't even know. To bring it back home here, how come I can never nail the betting lines when it comes to any of your Bishop Ryan teams, man? I'm just like way off every time. I can pick them pretty well though. Other than the Lions, though. What's up with that? No idea. <laughs> We're just trying to win. No idea. We got to end it on that high note. Roger Coleman, thanks a lot. Thank you.